Let's talk about B'Tselem. Are they really the Israeli Center for Human Rights, or do they actually believe that Israel shouldn't exist as a nation? Did you know that one-fourth of all Arab localities in Israel actually have a biblical Hebrew name? You're going to want to find out all about this on today's episode of the Joshua and Caleb Report. In a world plagued with anti-Israel propaganda, Hagavel presents the Joshua and Caleb Report. A positive voice of truth, straight from Israel's heartland. In a world of negativity and fake news, every Christian should be connected to the life and positivity that Israel brings to the world. Guys, you're back here at the Joshua and Caleb Report. Luke, good to have you on the show today. We got a Thanks. power pack show today, and let me tell Thanks you. Thanks for acknowledging my name is Luke. Yeah, you're Luke. That's right. Don't, yeah. Hello, world. My name's Luke. <laughs> hey, Joshua and Caleb Report just means that we're giving Joshua and Caleb news. Guys, I'm hey. glad my name's Joshua, but your name doesn't have to be Luke to be on the Joshua and no. Caleb Report. Uh, I think half of our comments are about that. No, not really. But, not half. But, okay. A few. We're getting a lot of good comments out there. We're actually going to talk about that today. Uh, but Luke, not Caleb. No crisis Thank here. Thank you. Luke. Glad to have you on the show. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about a lot of really good stuff. But first, guys, go ahead and subscribe. You want to get this good feed every week right. to your inbox or however it is. YouTube, click the bell. Luke, you always give this. I don't know even how this works. <laughs> Are you uh, you're the tech guy. I am subscribed because <laughs> oh, I job. do get, I get notified. Yeah, um, yeah well, hey, we have a lot of other shows um, that are not even on this YouTube channel because the Joshua and Caleb Report is part of a network. And you can find all the rest of our content. We have articles, too. It's all at Joshua and Caleb.com. Of course, if you want to help produce the show, you can join as a Patreon member at patreon.com slash Joshua and Caleb, and you can actually invest directly in this show to get more and better content straight from Israel's heartland broadcasted to the world. Guys, uh, Israel's elections, you know what? Yep. That's probably one of the most complicated. There, the other people think there's complicated things going on in the world, but the Israel's elections is probably one of the comp most complicated political scenes there are. Uh, there's a big, huge gamut of, of people involved in it, but right now, as it stands, uh, the president of Israel, which is actually not the chief uh, in command. President, no. not unlike America, uh, is just the one who taps and gives orders from the back. The prime minister is the one in charge. Uh, President Rivlin has tapped Netanyahu to form a government. As literally as of like an hour ago. Um, is that going to happen, Luke? Everybody's right. saying no, it's not really So here's how it works. The president of Israel, which is largely a symbolic position, um, he taps who he thinks has the best chance to form a government. And he tapped Prime Minister Netanyahu because he got 52 members of Knesset to recommend him. Uh, the next highest was Yair Lapid, who got 45 MKs, and then Naftali Bennett only got seven. So it was basically like a last-ditch uh, scenario because R President Rivlin doesn't even believe that Netanyahu has a chance, but he had to give him the mandate because he got the most the out most, of anybody else. Yeah. You need at least 61 uh, MKs to support you to be able to form a government. He only got 52. Um, so he, he's got, basically, that means he has the next 28 days to try and put together a coalition government and if he fails, he can get a 14-day extension, or the president can take the mandate back and give it to somebody else. So we'll see what happens. If uh, a couple of MKs could lay down their egos and join Netanyahu's government, then we might see something get done. Otherwise, it's going to be a complete stalemate. Which means fifth elections, and that's what everybody's predicting at this point. But pray for Israel that we uh, wouldn't have fifth elections, <laughs> that we could actually get some somewhere. Uh, yep. Luke, we got uh, this comment. We get a lot of comments as we talked about. This Navy dude, 2007, he says, uh, full of lies, Zionist lovers. Arabs have been in Palestine for thousands of years. Long live Jerusalem, the eternal capital of Palestine. Um, okay, Navy dude. Um, we, we, there's a little bit of, there's a little problem here, Luke, because mm -hmm. Navy dude doesn't understand history. Just basic history. Even if you go to the, uh, okay, who, okay, most people in the, at least the leftist world, trust the UN. The right. UN even called this area that we are sitting in right now. Okay, folks, if you didn't know that, Luke and I are actually sitting in, in the area we're talking about. Luke, I think that gives a little bit of credibility. We're actually oh, yeah. sitting where we're talking about. That's okay, right. the UN, uh, before 1950, actually called where we're sitting, not West Bank, they actually called it Judea and Samaria. I actually did not know that until just now. So that's, that's pretty cool. The UN itself. If you go back to look at maps before mm -hmm. 1950 when they actually changed it. So 1948, the Jewish state was founded. And then uh, 1950 is actually when they started changing things, changing right. maps, uh, getting things situated uh, back to a... Uh, but this region, like, okay, so you had Judea and you had Samaria to the mm -hmm. north of Judea. Mm -hmm. um, so that's literally... Well, Yudav it was Jordan. Shamron. 
Right. It was Jordan that named the area the West Bank because at the end of the war, 1948, you had Egypt occupying Sinai and Gaza. You had Israel uh, that ended up with a lot of the territory they're in today. And but then Jordan was occupying Judea and Samaria, and they decided to call it the West Bank because it was the West Bank of the Jordan River. And that's and uh, that name just stuck. Right. And that's 1950, Luke. Right. 1950. Not that long that's ago. That's not very long ago. Okay, guys. So if you don't believe that, uh, we're just going to keep, we're going to dig a little bit back here. Okay. So Hebron, Hebron. Hebron is mm-hmm. the um, the largest, or one of the largest Arab towns today uh, inside of Judea and Samaria, or right. if you guys want to be real modern uh, and forget history, a lot of people are trying to wipe history out. If you want to be at the history remake, go ahead and call it West Bank. Luke and I, we're not going to be, we're not history remakers. We're, we're going to go back and we're going to actually read history for what it actually says. I like to call it fake West Bank. Fake West Especially Bank. Especially because it helps when you're educating people. You kind of need to use the terms. People get on to me all the time. Stop calling it the West Bank. Well, the reason I do it sometimes is so that I can educate people about the real name. All right. So, but uh, I like to call it fake West Bank because that kind of speaks for itself. Okay. So, Hebron in Hebrew means friend. Okay. Right. So okay. It comes from friend. Um, yeah. And I'm not going to say this Arabic word, right? But the Arabic word for friend is, is al al Khalil. 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 Something like that. I probably um, didn't say right. Not fluent. Don't hardly know any Arabic. Uh, but literally, the, the, it was named off of the Hebrew name. So, right. they said this town is friend. In Hebrew, we're going to name it friend in Arabic. Okay, so there's actually uh, about a quarter, as you said in the intro, Luke, about a quarter of the uh, Arab cities all throughout this mm-hmm. the area of Israel oh, yeah. actually have biblical, just like this, Hebron, one of the biggest Arab towns. The same story continues all hey, the way throughout. Another brainstorm in the middle of the show. Maybe we should do an adventure show where we go to all the towns, overlook the town, and give the Arabic name that actually held the designation of the ancient Hebrew name. That would be cool. That would be super Because, uh, yeah, cool. you were totally right. I've, I've, we both experienced that over the last yeah. 15 years is, you know, you will have a tour guide or somebody that knows the area say, well, this Arab town actually means the same thing that the Jewish town that's a quarter of a mile away it's called today because it was preserving the name and the location of the Jewish town from 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And more than that, Luke, as we discussed last week, this is just a follow-up for some questions that people had in the comments. <clears throat> um, there's hardly, uh, there's not even one, you said. Uh, there's one, and that was Ramallah, I think you said, or, or Ramla, Ramla was Ramla, it was. Yeah. Uh, not Ra- Ramallah, not to be confused, um, is the only one that actually had Arabic origin. Fairly new, right? right? Um, so everything else is Greek or Roman, if they're not. The quarter, which it actually goes back, right. Jewish, uh, Israelite backgrounds. Okay, so enough of that. Um, that's that's big. Oh, but, but Hebron, we got to talk about Hebron a little bit because if this truly goes back and the Arabs name it after, that just seems pretty clear. Uh, Hebron is the most ancient Jewish town in Israel. This goes back, back, okay. back, back. Okay, King David. Well, okay, right. if you're reading the Bible, King David was king there before he was king in Jerusalem. Well, Abraham was buried there. Right. Uh, if you want to go all the even way back before to like Hebron was probably established as a city, but the same exact spot. They say Joshua and Caleb the spies actually come to Hebron, mm-hmm. and okay, even if you don't believe that part, Caleb comes and takes Hebron. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So okay, Hebron in English goes all the way back. You just keep going and going and going. The most ancient Jewish town uh, and the second holiest in Jewish tradition. They honor the tomb of the patriarchs that stands there in Hebron today. Um, so uh, what's 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 the uh, navy dude? We're educating Navy Dude right now, and anybody else that agrees with Navy Dude, hey, this like is just name. basic cool history. Name. That's a really cool name. I mean, I really like it. 2007, that was probably even, right. even better. Um, so, uh, Navy Dude, there's uh, 4,000 years. Let me just talk to Navy Dude for a second, Luke. Okay. 4,000 years of continuous Jewish presence documented in Hebron. Okay, that, okay, I just talked to Navy Dude. By That's the way, historic, Luke. both of us have seen the actual road in Hebron. That is 4,000 years old. Yeah. Like, archaeologically, they have found this road made out of stones to be 4,000 years old. Yeah. I'm saying this is just I think it's one of the oldest, like, archaeological sites in the world. And before Navy Dude throws his rock at me, Luke, um, I just lied a little bit, but not completely. There was a little section of time that Jews were not there, and it was recently. 1929. 1929, Luke? 19, mm, okay. 1939 or 1929, there was a time where, 1929, when the Jews actually were massacred yeah. by the Arabs. So this is, this I think 19, 1929. 1929, yeah. I got it here. 1929 to 1967, there was a massacre. Yep. The Arab, there was an uprising under the British, and the Arabs killed every, everybody or kicked them out. Nobody was left. There was a huge massacre. Tons of Jews died in this massacre. Okay, 
there was a few years there where no presence, Jewish presence was in Hebron. Yeah. And that was from 29 to 67. Uh, so there you are for that. The, uh, a, a terrible massacre took place. Okay, so again, this town, 1929 or 1967, was not the first time Jews stepped foot into Hebron. This was an ancient, ancient town. Uh, King David's anointed there. And get this today. Okay, we're finishing up Hebron here. Jews only are allowed today to live in 3% of Hebron today. Wow. Arabs uh, take the, the Arabs control 80% and live in 97% of the Hebron. So whenever you hear, and okay, we just threw a really big hmm. thing. When we said Hebron, and we're talking about Hebron right now, Hebron is the hot spot for leftist anti-Israel propaganda. If yep. anybody out there is listening to this, don't listen to the propaganda machines. Literally, Luke, you and I have been walking down Hebron, yep. and they they it's absolutely the biggest pr- producer of propaganda yeah. that the leftists have. Betzalim, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. They love Hebron because they like to twist the story. The leftist twist to Hebron is absolutely, ri- I mean, it's sickening to take the beauty of the story of Hebron and the Jewishness of Hebron and the ancient history of Hebron and twist that story so sour to actually make it an anti-Israel propaganda. Luke, we got so yep. much to cover here. Um, we could go talk about Jerusalem. 3,000 years of presence in Jerusalem. Could always the holy site of Israel. No other nation in the world has held is- Jerusalem as the capital. No, nobody. The- Jerusalem's only been the capital of the nation of Israel. Right. That's 3,000 years Unless you want to go back to the Jebusites, maybe, which is like ancient, 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 okay. ancient, ancient. Right, but we're talking about Palestinians, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't think they're okay. around anymore, okay. the Jebusites. Okay. Exactly. They if you want to go out, okay, start from biblical times. Yeah, that's what we're right, okay. right. All, All right, right. so you. Shiloh. 3,000 yep. or 369 well, years ago. Tabernacle, there, yeah. 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago. Uh, even if you want to go to 100 and, uh, 1,800 years ago, uh, you got Gush Etzion area. That's the modern Gush Etzion. So we're just talking about areas literally that are represented right. in this so called West Bank area. This is Israel's foot. This is like the, the heart. Footprint. This is li- literally where. By the way, there's yeah. actual footprints all over this area. So. Yeah. No, like the narrative. archaeology, you can talk about wine presses, olive presses. There's more than 300 that are in Judea and Samaria, which is a 100% can only be Jewish presence because the Muslims don't make wine. They don't drink wine. Um, they're hard to argue with. And it just, the list goes on and on and on. The pottery all over Samaria that dates back to the times of the tabernacle and on all throughout recent history, it just goes on and Luke, on. Literally, and on. I can walk out of this office right here in the studio and I can go and I can walk to a, a wine press that yeah. right here. And there's 300 yeah. other ones that are like documented. A couple hundred meters away from here. Um, and the Palestinians, they don't even drink wine. Okay. Yeah. Just scratch that out. It's of the box. one place where you can lead an Arab and, and they have no argument to come back at you with. Okay, Navy dude, if you have anything to say about this history, let us know. Send Josh an email. No, send it to Luke. <laughs> um, guys, quickly, we're going to talk about a left-wing NGO operating here in Israel. A lot of people think they're a credible organization and a credible place to get facts from. But first, I want to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the show. Okay, this is a book that I co-wrote along with my other brother-in-law, Zach Waller. And it's called Facing Jerusalem, God's Plan for Global Redemption. And you can go to facingjerusalemthebook.com and order a copy today. And if you use the promo code Joshua and Caleb, you get a special listener-only discount. But this book talks about if how if you're a Christian and you believe in the Bible, then facing Jerusalem and paying attention to Jerusalem and having a real focus and emphasis on the city of Jerusalem and Israel in your life can uh, be a real, like, it's one of those things that is a must. And it's, it's, a, it's a part of the blessing that God talked about when he, when he talked to Abraham and said that you will be the source of blessing for the entire world. Well, the, one of the keys is facing Jerusalem. Daniel faced Jerusalem. is one reason why he got thrown in the lion's den. Even the apostle Paul and uh, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, had a huge emphasis on Jerusalem. So you can go to facingjerusalemthebook.com and order a copy. Use the promo code Joshua and Caleb for a special listener-only discount and find out how Facing Jerusalem is God's plan for your redemption wherever you are in the world today. Josh, uh, a lot of people I've noticed on our YouTube channel, looking at the comments, they like to quote this organization called Betzelem, and I probably don't say their name right either. It's it's connected to like uh, photography and and video, but like kind of the root I think is like documenting things. So Betzelem is their their goal is like to document I think violence by Israel in the West Bank. 
That's Israeli how it started. Information Center for Human Rights in Judea and Samaria. I think they started and Gaza. specifically on the West Bank to just document like what they thought was violence right. and stuff like that, and now they've expanded to basically just like delegitimizing Israel. So mm-hmm. we're going to talk about that. But um, a lot of people quote Betzalem. And they say, well, the the uh, credible organization, Beth Salem, which is the Israeli Center for Human Rights in Israel, said this, and they put links to an article. So I noticed a lot of people doing it. So I decided it was probably time that we actually talk about who this organization actually is, because they're not a credible source of information. And uh, at the end here, stay hang tight, because like every single one of Israel's main liberal leaders in the Knesset actually 100% condemn them, these guys. Not even like just the conservative guys, but like a whole bunch of the actual guys on the left-wing political spectrum as well. Any person that holds a the citizenship of the state of Israel should be absolutely irate at this yes. comment that I'm about to tell you. This is the front page, Luke. I went on the Betzalem front page. This is what it says. Uh, a regime of Jewish supremacy. That's that's how they start out. That's right. that's like you know I would say the nation of Israel. Right. This is a regime of Jewish supremacy. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's auto- automatically like well, okay. As soon what as in the you, world? As soon as you say Jewish supremacy, that is like such a like racist, discriminatory, yeah. horrible thing to say because basically they're saying they're they're accusing Israel of trying to exist in a country. I call like ISIS a regime or something like that. Like, okay. But I like mean, like supremacy, basically saying that the Jewish people are trying to take over the world or something or trying to take, like, you know what's even worse? This organization is an Israeli organization, like headed by Israelis. They're basically self- Just leftists. Self-haters. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so look, this is the total coming. A regime of Jewish uh, supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. This is apartheid. That's their opening banner when you open their website. Right. Well, it's a huge, they actually have a whole other website and like we could get into it in another show. It's a campaign they launched just a couple months ago. They're trying to blast to the world and they went all over media and everywhere blasting to the world that, that, a regime of Jewish supremacy, not only from the Jordan River inside the Green Line to the Mediterranean Sea. They're trying to say this is apartheid, and you have some uh, stuff about the actual meaning of apartheid here in a minute. Yeah. But just to point out, they're not talking about the West Bank or Gaza. They're talking about the entire state of Israel, saying the entire state of Israel oh, yeah. is apartheid, yeah. and more or less saying that they don't deserve to exist here. Yeah. And look, if you want to talk about apartheid, what is apartheid? Apartheid is actually a uh, Afrikaans word. Right. It's it's not an English word. It's it's an Afrikaans word that actually uh, means uh, racial separation, right? So it's this is the uh, Merriam-Webster, okay, if, if anybody, the leftist out there would want to know what this means. The apartheid, it's a racial segregation, but specifically, okay, that's in broad mm-hmm. terms, that's what it means, but it's specifically only talking about what happened in South Africa that specifically, this is a Afrikaans word that's relating what actually happened in South Africa. Okay, so we want to talk about what happened in South Africa and put it on what's happening here in Israel. There's absolutely zero comparisons. Right. One, they're dealing with citizens, okay? Mm-hmm. Citizens of South Africa have a an apartheid, a mm-hmm. problem dealing with situations. Okay, to, to make this apartheid word make sense here in Israel, it would be citizens uh, showing racial uh, segregation to other citizens okay so okay. that's that's problem that's problem number one is everybody's confused about what this apartheid thing is anyway okay so if if we're talking about citizens and you've already covered uh supremacy right supremacy is the highest authority or greatest power okay so israelis holding uh citizenship those holding citizenship in this nation should be the ones that are actually in authority Wow. What do you know? Is Brainstorm. That, okay, Luke, is that... Uh, Light bulb moment. Am I being like too... Is this too common sense? Um, yeah, pro- probably so, yeah. I think it's too If anybody's sense. watching from bedtime, it might be a They're little gonna bit They're going to really be irate for this. <laughs> but this is too much common sense. Okay, so a citizen of the country is different than a non-citizen. Right. Okay? All right, so a citizen uh, is a uh, participatory member of a political community. This is also just taken offline. Citizenship is gained by meeting the legal requirements of a national, state, or local government. A nation grants certain rights. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. And privileges Mm -hmm. to citizens. (laughs) What, Luke? Okay, this is the definition of citizens. Okay, citizens are expected to obey their country's laws and defend it against their enemies. Right. Okay, Luke, that's just the basic uh, line of citizen. Okay, but here's where Betzalem tries to blur the line, right? 
they, as part of this apartheid campaign, they say, quote, more than 14 million people, roughly half of them Jews, and the other half Palestinians live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea under a single rule. And what they're arguing is that the Palestinian people that are half of the 14 million population uh, do not have equal rights to the Jews. Now, if I was somebody living in you know, New Zealand and heard that, I would say that's awful. Terrible. That's just horrible. What, are we going to actually break this down into what this actually means? Yeah, we got to break it down. Got to. Um, first of all, you got down. the Central Bureau, Bureau of Statistics here. Citizens in Israel, 9.291 million, not 14 million. Okay. okay. Uh, the Jews are 6.87, it's almost 7 million. Arabs are 1.9 million, and those are Israel's citizens. And they all have <laughs> equal rights. The Arabs there are what Betselem is referring to as Palestinians. They're actually Arab Israeli citizens. They have 100% full equal rights to their Jewish counterpart. Okay. Unlike that what Betselem says. And that Betselem equals, says, no, they don't have rights. Guys, that's And that equals bull. just over 9 million. Now, what Betselem is trying to include in that number is the residents of the Gaza Strip yeah. and the West Bank, the Palestinian residents, Let's which look. they have highly inflated. We talked about the numbers of the Palestinians Even a if you ago. inflate them, it doesn't work. It doesn't nearly come out to what they say because they're, they're saying, what, like 5 million in Judea and Samaria and 2 million in the Gaza Strip, which, which even is the, probably more like a million in the Gaza Strip and 1 to 2 million in Judea and Samaria. Most right? right-wing people and conservatives say there's 1.5 million as a right. relatively good count. We've talked about it on the show before. They're estimating at least 3 million here and another... Two million in Israel proper, uh, which still doesn't give them to their count of being seven million. Right. There's still some, you know. I guess I've got Gaza, they're but they're also inflate, counting inflating their numbers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's still this is absolutely which they have false. a proven track record of, and I'm talking about that in a minute again. Yeah. But of just getting one, pulling one number from one source, which is usually a very liberal. A left wing source and going with it, and of course people believe it. Luke, this is all on the first page of Betzalim's website. Mm -hmm. This is the front page that we've just covered. Absolute myths. Talking about Israel's as apartheid nation, out of context, not the correct meaning of it. Doesn't have anything to do with it. And if they do mean apart apartheid, um, we, we should talk about what apartheid actually is for the Arabs. Um, if you're talking about apartheid, when when a Jewish person, there's literally a big red sign in front of these Arab towns that says no Jews allowed to enter. Area A, illegal. No Jews allowed to enter. Okay, if people are looking up apartheid in hey, South Africa, that's what right. it says. Certain groups are not allowed to enter. That does not exist in Israel. There's right. no place that somebody with proper paperwork, which is actually every nation in the world, <laughs> I cannot go Amazing. some places in the world without the proper paperwork. Well, especially when you're talking about a non-citizen. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, the, and the deal is Palestinians can cross the Green Line. They can go from the West Bank to Gaza or to Israel proper. They can fly other places in the world. All you have to do is get the proper paperwork right. and permits. And if you hear a story about them not being able to get the proper paperwork, guess what? It's probably because they have some kind of connection to a terrorist. Yeah. Exactly. Very, very, very likely. But in normal circumstances, it's very easy for Palestinians to get visas, to get permits, to travel with in other parts. A lot of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians work in Israel proper every day. Just by saying that there's Arab citizens, you've automatically, Betselem, let's talk to Betselem right. for a second, you've automatically just proven that Israel is no apartheid state. There is Arab citizens just like <gasps> everybody else. What do you and know? And they have okay. full equal rights. Bibi they're Netanyahu. Not, well, they're not second grade citizens. Can I just say this, Luke? Bibi Netanyahu did not say this. Guess who said this? The Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas said this, okay? If anybody's wondering, this, this, whoever said this statement is agrees with, a, with an apartheid theology. Okay, you ready? It says, Mahmoud Abbas publicly states that in a Palestinian Arab state, if a Palestinian Arab state is created in the West Bank, where Luke and I are sitting right now, no Jews will be allowed. Mm. That's just what sounds like said. apartheid to me. Okay, so F, okay, let's just flip it absolutely on its head. These are facts, Luke. We're talking about history and facts on the ground here. And if that happens, Jews are expelled. Jews no longer can go to Hebron to the the second holy site and and ancient, hundreds most of site other of biblical sites all throughout Judea. Exactly, right. exactly that. Josh, I want to talk a little bit more about Beth Salem, and uh, and then we're going to finish off by giving you what Israel's uh, leadership and politicians actually think about this organization. Yeah. Okay. Um, Here's where most of their donations come from. European Union, they actually got, uh, I think I took it off here, but they got 300,000 euros from the European Union. 
Wow. 300000 That's a lot of money. We could use that. Um, Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law Secretariat, which is funding from Sweden, Switzerland, Denmark, Netherlands, Norway, Netherlands, France, uh, United Kingdom, Denmark. So if you're from one of those countries, I'm very sorry. You need to work on your government. Uh, cracking down on this. Um, oh, sorry. Here's where it was. They, Betselem and Breaking the Silence, another left-wing NGO, received right. 300,000 euros from the EU for, quote, strategic and objective information and analysis on settler violence. I don't know what they spent all that money on because <laughs> it would not take very long to document the settler violence here in Judea and Samaria. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But here's the <laughs> kicker. They get 65% of their funding from foreign countries, okay? Um, maybe uh, a little bit of common sense information here. Israelis if, if don't If you're an NGO believe. that gets more than 50% of your funding from foreign sources, then maybe you are not such a good um, patriotic organization in your country. And shouldn't be representing your people. How about that? Exactly. Okay, what do Israel's leaders, politicians think about Betzalem? Yair Lapid, the leader of the liberal parties, basically. Well, he basically got... Liberal. Uh, Yeshatid got the most amount of seats after Netanyahu's Likud in this election. Yair Lapid in 2016 in the Jerusalem Post was re- wrote an op-ed in response to Betzalem's report on Operation Protective Edge, where they just totally blasted the IDF, right? He said, quote, it's a biased opinion piece by a radical left-wing organization which has no problem lying to achieve its goals. They were using Hamas's numbers when reporting on the number of terrorists versus civilians who were killed. They were, they were saying tons of civilians were killed, and they actually took Hamas's, a designated terrorist organization, according to the United States, and used those numbers. And the IDF's official report was like half of those numbers. And Lapid says, even Israel's harshest critics admit that Hamas inflated the numbers to serve its propaganda. And this is what Betzalem is going with. The, the terrorist organization. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another leftist MK who is part of the uh, labor bloc, which is like even further the left, left than yeah. um, Yair Lapid, right? Uh, they said because uh, Betzalem went to the UN, they had like a special meeting and where they completely condemned it, basically asking the UN to step in and condemn settler uh, settlement activity in Judea and Samaria. Uh, Itzik Shmuley from the Labor Party here in Israel. Um, said that by going to the UN, Betzalem helps demonization of Israel. He said the move was unhelpful and helped promote the demonization of Israel. A Labor Party activist, a lawyer, actually filed treason, a treason complaint against Betzalem. They actually filed to the police. They said there's reason to believe that Betzalem is committing treason. And it's because they have worked to damage the sovereignty of the state give away land to a foreign entity and take in steps that could cause a war. And the three accusations are listed as clauses in Israel's criminal cro- code under treason. So yeah, you Sounds have like treason to complete me. liberal leftist people going to the police, going to Israel's government, saying these guys are complete nuts. An actual Israeli NGO. Uh, two more, Israel Beitano leader Avigdor Lieberman, who's supposed to be right wing, but he's not really anymore. Uh, he called Betzalem traitors, charging that the left-wing uh, leaning group was funded by the same people who finance Hamas, which sadly is probably true. And lastly, Bibi Netanyahu said, quote, in Israeli democracy, fleeting and bizarre organizations like Betzalem can also express themselves. It's a free country, right? But most of the public knows the truth. We will continue to defend justice and our state in the face of all international pressure. So no, Betzalem, this is not an apartheid state and nothing you can say can prove that. And by the way, if you're looking for news, incredible information out of Israel, the left, we left, completely left NGO, Betzalem is not a credible source of information, even according to Israel's most liberal and left leaning politicians. That's right. That's why it's your job to spread the truth of what's actually happening here in the biblical heartland of Israel. And that's why I appreciate you supporting the Joshua and Caleb report, because that is our number one mission is to spread the actual report of what's going on here in Israel's biblical heartland. In the meantime, be strong, be courageous, and be the voice of Joshua and Caleb in your generation. Hi guys, if you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We also have 
tons more incredible content straight from Israel's heartland, which you can find completely free at joshuaandcaleb.com. If you're interested in signing up for a life-changing volunteer program in Israel's heartland, you can go to serveisrael.com. We host Christians from all over the world to help plant trees, harvest grapes, prune vines, and basically help farmers all over Judea and Samaria all while experiencing the land and people of Israel in a way that you're never going to get on a 10-day tour. Just go to serveisrael.com to find out more information.